Hi guys, welcome back to our series. We're continuing our intermediate series today by discussing this, which is a red tail racer. As you can see, putting on a show, it's a fantastic species. But I am somewhat, uh, what's the word, conflicted about whether I should put it into the intermediate or advanced. So for now, it's in the intermediate. Hopefully as I carry on, we will, you'll see where my conflict comes from why uh, maybe it's not quite as straightforward as could be first thought hello darling you okay showing its displeasure so in a perfect world as a captive bred specimen this falls into intermediate as wild caught and imported specimen almost certainly advanced its common names are red tail rat snake red tail green rat snake red tail racer Mangrove racer, list goes on. Common names are a pain in the arse. Make it easier. It is called Goniosoma oxycophalum. That is its proper name. So it was first described as Caluba oxycophalus in 1827 by Boy. Then changed to Goniosoma viride. And this is the first use of Goniosoma and that was by Wagler. Um, when was that by Wagler? That was a year later, so Goniosoma was born in uh, 1828. Um, so, hyper after that, it was then Herpetodryas oxycophalus by Schlegel, Allopecophus chalybeus in 1849 by Gray, Goniosoma oxycophalum, which it is now, but back in 1853 by Dumeril, uh, Apedia robusta in 1861 by Halliwell, uh, Caluba oxycophalus by Muller, Caluba uh, floweri by Werner, Alafe oxycophala by Smith. Then it was interesting, it went Alafe oxycophala oxycophala and Alafe oxycophala floweri by Bure, and I'll go more into that later on. Goniosoma floweri, Goniosoma oxycophala, Goniosoma species by Mertens, and finally, Goniosoma oxycophalum once again. The type locality for this species is Java in Indonesia. This is a large snake. Uh, do not be fooled. It is very impressive when it's full grown. Um, anything from 180 to 200 centimetres. Specimens in excess of 230 to 240 centimetres have been known and were referred to by both Griffin and War respectively. Normal coloration. Now, this is if there is such a thing, this is where the challenge lies. And obviously, I'm holding a certain phase here, but normal coloration throughout the body is green. There's usually a thin yellow ring bordering the tail by the anal vent, and then the tail is a purplish brown, but never actually red. Yellow populations exist in both the Philippines and Thailand, but because Philippines, for example, don't export, we aren't ever really going to see them in captivity here um, there is a bronze or brown type that exists and this accounts for the flower eye names mentioned above in the list that I made and I'll obviously share these notes as I do with the videos always so that you've got them to refer to and they thought that they were a distinct species or subspecies hence the goniosoma flower eye or the alafe oxycophala flower eye which was the bronze or brown form Oxycophala, oxycophala was the green form. There's also a silver species, ta -da, uh, which uh, occurs in central Java, um, and this and the green phase are the most common phases seen in captivity. Um, the silvers are quite sought after, incredibly pretty, as you can see with the green head, and just amazing animals, amazing. Um, so, potentially it's just a highly variable snake with a number of different colour schemes throughout its range. And then we come to its range. Its range is huge and occurs across much of Southeast Asia. So I've got another list that I've got to refer to here, so I will list them all. Northern Thailand, the Malay Peninsula, uh, Sunda Islands, the Philippines, Banker Island, Biliton, Borneo or Kalimantan, Sumatra, Java, Lombok, Laos, Sabah, Singapore and Vietnam. Generally accepted as being an arboreal species, the green specimens are known to rarely if ever come to ground. Conversely, silvers are known to have a slightly more terrestrial habit. 
Is this a result of colour? Who knows, but it would certainly make sense. It's hard to hide in a green tree when you're metallic silver in colour. It's not proven, just a personal hypothesis. Um, so uh, a large spacious enclosure will be required for established animals. Established animals. That's the key here. Uh, I will say more about that in a moment. With climbing apparatus and plentiful hiding opportunities off the ground. These hives should be stuffed with uh, sphagnum moss, which is kept damp to help keep localised humidity levels high. Um, when higher humidity levels needed, they will take to this, but generally the humidity within the tank should be maintained at between 65 and 85% all the time. Bad sheds and respiratory infections are the upshot of you getting it wrong and the standards or um, the uh, atmosphere within the enclosure, the biome you've created not quite being right. Um, cleanliness is next to godliness with this species, uh, as skin infections can also occur. Welcome to the challenges of Godiosoma. So, when thinking long term about housing of this species, it may well be prudent to consider a plastic solution. Not glass as it's too exposed and that might lead to stress. This is an animal that is easily stressed, so if it's exposed on all three sides, it's known for striking or darting. It may well hurt its nose by trying to escape through the side of a tank. Uh, and interaction with clear borders, which is a known stressor of snakes. And for such an easily stressed imported species, then I probably wouldn't recommend it. Um, wooden booths, they're going to rot in five minutes. So you're either going to have to seal it to within an inch of its life with yacht varnish or plastic line it with perspex or similar inside so that you can make it uh, either water resistant or totally waterproof. Temperature range should be between 29 and 30 degrees Celsius at the hot spot with a cool end that reduces down to between 24 and 26 at the cool end. These can drop several degrees, two or three degrees at night. Seasonal temperature manipulation may not strictly be necessary as they're generally an equatorial species. Um, so, but you know, it may be prudent to encourage some breeding behavior, whether that's the manipulation the circadian rhythms, the day-night cycle, increase in humidity level or a drop-off in humidity level. Some of these manipulations can act as triggers and help to get them breeding. That is in the long term, though. We've got a long way to go, it's particularly if we're dealing with something such as this imported specimen here. We have got a massive hill to climb, which I will get to in a moment. Um, so, most commonly available is wild-caught specimens, and therein lies the rub. As captive bred established babies, these are mid to high level intermediate specimens. As wild caught, they're advanced. Certainly for the first 12 months, there is a lot of shit to sort out. Eventually, once established and we're fully acclimatized, yeah, they'll fall down into intermediate. But you're in for a rough ride for this first 12 months. First 12 weeks can be a challenge. So let's just go through it bit by bit. The most common killer of this species is dehydration. There is a need to replace electrolytes, salts and amino acids as a matter of urgency upon first being imported. These animals will have been collected, kept in shitty conditions and then shipped over here. It may have been upwards of a week since their last drink. They have got both internal and external parasites which will be ravaging them and therefore their hydration levels have fallen through, the, through their arse. There's, there's not left we need to replace this in Sharpish. A UK product that's on the market is Reptaboost, which is um, loaded with all the vitamins, minerals, amino acids, salts that we need. And we would be, I would personally be using a catheter down the throat connected to a uh, syringe where I can put it straight into the stomach. It, alternatively, you put it in the drinking water. You must not spray the animal with this as the bacteria can turn bad, start uh, fungal and bacterial uh, blooms on the skin which again causes more problems. So or if you're going to bathe your animal in Reptaboost, you must then rinse it in clean water because again, the bacteria causes problems if left on the skin. So uh, when they need to get the animal feed in, oh, right, well, this is a challenge. The greens are known to be a bit more picky with their food and therefore um, they prefer birds. So scenting with chick or similar to be able to get them onto mice is almost certainly required. Uh, it can be 
um, a pain in the ass to get them to actually even keep hold of their food. They are quite strike happy. They will lash out and therefore not keep hold of their food. They will drop it to look at whatever's still moving around them. So you need to freeze. So patience is a huge virtue when it comes to the feeding of this species. You are going to need to breathe deep because the potential for you to get in a few grey hairs trying to get these going on food may well uh, prove out. According to Klaus Dieter Schultz, the silvers are actually, because of their more terrestrial habit, more inclined to accept mammalian prey. In honesty, I have noticed no difference in either the habit or the dietary requirements of either silver or green phase. And I would say, oh, conservatively, the pool is probably 50 or 60 specimens over the last 20 years that I've kept. No discernible difference. They're all a pain in the arse. Um, so some start immediately. Others will turn your hair white. There are no definitives here. Welcome to advanced acclimatization. Once established feeding, we then need to take time to raise body weight and body fat reserves so that we can move on to the next stage of acclimatization. The next stage of acclimatization is worming. And we're going to use fenbendazole, uh, which is sold as either Panicure or Equine Guard. It is available in its 10% 10 10 suspension. And we administer that to the animal at 0.5 mil per kilo. This is to strip out the worms from the gut. Um, this will cause the stripping out of the gut of both the good and the bad. And once again, probiotics with electrolytes, amino acids and salts come into their own to replace the good bacteria that we have just got shot of. To have done this when the animal was first shipped will almost certainly have resulted in the animal's death and an almost immediate dehydration because you're just sucking the very life out of its guts. Um, and that's not a good thing in the in the. Um, immediate term upon arrival so uh, parasites under the skin may also now erupt and cause blisters these must be cleaned with iodine wound cleansers or similar and these take a number of sheds to subside shitty sheds during this period are normal it is not down to your humidity you will get skin breakouts you will get blisters you will get unexplained lumps and bumps which we have been dealing with on this one um, and we're having to treat it and you know it's slowly but surely coming around but this is going to be long term we're going to have this animal a good while before we can offer it for sale uh, welcome to responsible reptile shop ownership and not some douchebag who just puts it straight in the bin um, so we're trying to deal with the blisters get them get them sorted out that's part of the, the deal with being um, panicured, it all just breaks out obviously they crap out the good, the bad and the ugly and then we get these blisters and lumps and bumps and we've got to try and sort those out make sure they're kept clean so now you're beginning to realise uh, why I wasn't in such a rush to put them into the intermediate level and also why I'm in no rush to put them into your wonderful great big bioactive enclosure uh, because housing during this period should be relatively confined, quiet and easily cleaned. Further incursions from pathogens would not be recommended, especially artificial uh, pathogen concentrations, the likes of which would be found in bioactive enclosures. You'll get there eventually, but we need to treat the animal first. We need to take it back down to its fundamental parts and build it back up again. Um, the pathogens... Uh, in bioactive uh, enclosures are what we call non-common cell. To be common cell means that these pathogens are part of its natural gut flora and fauna. The bioactive enclosures are artificially created living enclosures which will have their own pathogen burdens. These pose an immuno risk to an animal. When your animal is captive bred, its immuno response is greater and it can cope with these incursions better. Over time, its immuno response strengthens and overall it strengthens the snake. If we try it in the, in the immediate term with an animal that is near exhaustion, um, on its arse immune system wise, we will kill it by exposing it to all these additional pathogens. No short order. I would sooner keep this animal in a uh, triage setup, clean, easily sort um, maintained. Uh, it is confined. It's not going to be 
uh, looked at permanently we've got it in a quiet room um, and you know I hate to say it but maybe even a racking system could be helpful <gasps> to kill me but it's the truth we need to establish it we need it to be clean we need it to be easy to sort out it kind of lends itself to that you know we're going to get to our big display tank but I doubt that you're going to do it between like before the first six to nine months that's the truth because hedging our bets I don't want to offer this animal any more shit to deal with than the stuff we're already trying to get it to deal with so that that's why I have the attitude I have towards this uh, temperaments a non-factor you're keeping an intermediate stroke advanced level snake they can be psychopaths they can want to bite this guy's actually proven to be not too bad he's blown up his uh, his air sac and he's shown his displeasure at being held but he's not trying to get away and he's quite happy to sit but that's the same can't be said for all animals some are going to really tear you to pieces I mean, it just is what it is um, these are a display animal they're not a pet um, they eventually will end up in a display tank which if well thought out and aesthetically pleasing will challenge any emerald tree bow or green tree python for impact they are truly stunning enjoy the species research the species and prepare this is something you will need to prepare for you jump into this at your own risk because it will go tits up very quickly okay so just take your time everything is slow we're just gonna make sure that we get the hydration up make sure that we uh, make sure the treatment is thorough we're not in a rush to expose it to these these pathogens from our bioactive or big and large tanks we're just going to keep them very sterile very clean to begin with we're going to break them down and build them back up again once we've done that hopefully you should have a wonderful snake uh, that will feed well uh, once established and be a truly stunning specimen but underestimate them and the difficulty of acclimatizing them at your peril we will continue the series i hope you're enjoying it still visit www.snakesandadders.co.uk to see what we're all about and we will keep the videos coming thanks guys